Okay, hey everyone, and thanks so much for being here at the Art to Life podcast. Um, so excited, so excited uh, to have two guests today, um, Susan Maximum and Ivy Ross. Uh, they've co-written a amazing book that releases today called Your Brain on Art. And uh, you guys, um, you know, this is like, this feels like the book to help understand ourselves, right? This is a book to help, uh, you know, understand how art transforms us. It's on uh, neuro aesthetics. We're gonna dive all into it. Um, but let me, these guys are, have so much, so many accolades behind them and have so, so much to talk about. <clears throat> and so I just gotta introduce them first. Okay, so Susan Maximum uh, is the founder and director of the International Arts, um, Arts and Mind Lab and the Center for Applied Neuroaesthetics at John Hopkins University School of Medicine, where she's a faculty member. She's also the co-director of the Neuro, Neuro Arts Blueprint with the Aspen Institute, works with both public and private sectors using art and culture-based evidence-based uh, approaches in areas including health, child development, workforce, innovation and rehabilitation, and social equity. So, um, and we have Ivy Ross um, and both of these folks, just as a spoiler alert, they're both friends of mine and we've done art together and have all of that. And reading these, uh, their backgrounds, it's uh, almost intimidating for me. And I, <laughs> but anyway, Ivy Ross is uh, the Vice President of Design for Hardware at Google. Um, and I'm just touching up upon a few things. You guys are so much here. Uh, she's been uh, head of product design and development for uh, all these amazing brands like Calvin Klein, Swatch, Mattel, Bosch and Lomb, uh, and Gap, um, contributing author to numerous books, including the Change Champions Field Guide and Best Practices in Leadership and Development um, and Organizational Change. Um, so much here, but she's also an artist. Uh, her innovative metalwork and jewelry is in, I mean, like 12 uh, collections of international museums. Uh, she's been the winner of the pre prestigious uh, endowment for the arts grant. And uh, anyway, she's, you know, both of these guys are, they're artists, they're creatives, visionaries, and just crazy creative explorers. And I, I just think we can kind of start there, but <laughs> this book is amazing. And um, we're going to need a definition of neuro aesthetics for everyone here, but Maybe we can just start. First, welcome you guys. Thank you. Great to be here. Thank you. So we've got Ivy here in the studio and Susan beaming in. It's Susan, where are, you? where are you? I'm in Baltimore, Baltimore, Baltimore. Maryland. Okay. Yep. Um, so either one of you can start, but maybe just for, for us listening, uh, just give us a sort of what are uh, neuro aesthetics and, and how did each of you kind of come into this study and inquiry? Maybe I'll jump in and, okay. and then, great. Uh, so neuroesthetics is a tremendously big word, right? And every time I hear it, I think, whoa, that's pretty impressive. Uh, <laughs> but, it, it, but it's really, when you get down to it, it's really the study of how the arts and aesthetic experiences measurably change the body, brain, and behavior, and how that knowledge can be translated into specific practices that, adva that advance our health and well-being. So uh, we call it, we call the field neuro arts, and we call researchers that are researching in the, in neuro aesthetics. And that's really a good way to kind of think about it. So it's easier to kind of talk through neuro arts. So in terms of how we both got into this, yeah. is that what you'd like to know? Um, well, Susan, you know, I get many LinkedIn requests and she I see this one from the, I, and usually I go delete, 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 and I see this one from the Arts and Mind Lab, and it's like, that blows my mind. I it's love a science that title. lab. I know. I know. Arts and Mind yeah. Lab. Yeah, and like, it's from Johns Hopkins. I'm yeah. like, what are they doing with the arts and yeah, our yeah. mind? And so I went, yes. And then we made a 30 minute call, and which Susan opened up by saying, I've been following your work for 25 years. And I said, that's called stalking. And she said, hear me out. <laughs> and then um, a 30 minute call went into three hours because when she told me what she was doing, which was using neuroscience to prove what I know myself, and I'm sure you and a lot of everyone watching this knows is what the arts does to yes, us, our yes, brain and body. Yes. And so, but, so at first when she told me, I said, 
I know that. And then I'm like, oh my God, no, but most people don't. And this is so amazing. This is so important. Um, and so Susan was asking me, maybe you wanted to talk, Susan, what you were calling me about. Tell, tell folks. Sure. So, so in our lab, we have something called the Luminary Scholars, and these are people that do extraordinary things in all these different fields. So we have playwrights, and we have musicians, and we have authors, uh, dancers, uh, researchers that have been studying different types of art forms. And I invited Ivy to be a Luminary Scholar because of the the, the tremendous biography that you just mentioned and all of the things that she's thought about in terms of design. We also share a love of play and I'll say a love of curiosity. Um, I started a company called Curiosity Kits um, around the, the well, 1988 um, and Ivy had been working at Mattel. So I had been, that's when I first became aware of Ivy's work when she was at Mattel designing toys for girls and thinking about play and what did play really mean? And, you know, um, there's a lot of four letter words in the world, play and arts are two of my favorite. And <laughs> And so we really aligned on that. And I wanted her, I wanted to tell her about this work because my intuition told me that this was something that she would be interested in. Yeah. And so we, we created that my home here in Mill Valley, a salon of, and I don't know where you were, you must have been away because you would definitely have been in that list of artists. It was like Noah's Ark. We brought- I remember this, yeah, yes. It was yes. like two painters, two dancers, two digital artists. And then uh, Susan brought down some of her neuroscientists and we sat in my living room and really had a discussion of what has the arts ever changed your life and in what way did it change your life and after that um, incredible couple of hours salon Susan looked at me and said I've always wanted to write a book on this do you want to do it with me and I'm like oh my god this is the book I've been waiting for wow. because and that's really how the adventure began wow well, one of the things that yeah. So one of the things that was so extraordinary about the people that told their stories, every story was different. Every story could have changed the way um, their lives, the trajectory of their lives. And I think for me, I work in the profession. So I work with, with arts practitioners. I work with researchers. I work with policymakers. But what had never happened and what I think this book is, is a way to bring this information to everybody. So it's written so that anybody could read it and, and be, get something from it, whether you are in the field, whether you're an artist or a designer, or whether you're someone who just wants to use this work for your own lives to enrich your kids' lives or your family's lives or your community. And so we thought it was really important to try to write it for that purpose. I was amazed because, and I'm just so excited and, and so much of my whole existence has been confirmed well, you from are the reading this book. You're the poster child, well, no, art to and, life, and, my God. Right, and so <laughs> I've, I have been doing this work, but I didn't have any science. I didn't know, I just had my experience and, and the proof of what occurred with people becoming more alive, everything that I teach is what you are it which is now this is the science behind it mm -hmm. and, and it's so it's incredible and mm -hmm. and i just love that that this is going to make it so much easier for people to understand and access and and believe well, you know feeling seen and feeling validated oh is one of the most important things we each strive for in our life so you're done <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> drop the mic no well i'll add that i also think that from a science point of view, we're just catching up to you, right? The artists have always been there first. You've always understood this intuitively. So what science is, is giving you just another way of knowing what you already knew that, that might be able to be used in service of humanity. And so in another way, so how might you think about dose and dosage? How might you think about how often someone wants to dance or, or understanding the transfer? Um, your work, Nick, is so interesting because it turns out that visual arts is something that transfers the skills and processes and all the things that you teach your students transfers into other parts of their lives. And that's the holy grail in learning. That's what you want. You want things to go from one domain of your life to another so you don't have to keep relearning things over and over again and i think that's an extraordinary finding yeah so your brain you know what i've learned from susan is your brain changes and makes new connections with all of these things that you're creating on canvas or making and those new neuro connections or synapses are used in maybe the way you approach 
some other part of your life, even though you may not be conscious of it. I love in the book you speak of the the value of daydreaming and what can occur when you're just making your art and your mind is released. Mm -hmm. Then problem solving starts to occur and all kinds of solutions start to rise up. And it's just an amazing so and I, I love how you were going to describe your book as I think you were going to you were going to uh, the title was going to be the 20 minute daily art practice yeah, or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because little and often and, and I have a daily art practice. So the whole thing just has been yeah. fabulous to read about. But yeah. well, you know, the outcome when, when people ask us um, what why we wrote the book, the truth is we wrote the book so that it, we would like to see people just like science is now convinced us that, that we need 20 minutes of exercise and eight hours of sleep. We want this to book, to convince people that you need to do 20 minutes of art a day, at least, or being either the maker or the beholder. So if you're not going to make the art, at least engage in um, being the beholder of the art, 20 minutes a day, and the health benefits are huge. So, but you guys who are out there doing this all the time, you're, you're in great shape. Well, it's interesting because we are, uh, you know, most people listening and as artists are trying to make a thing. And what I discovered in trying to help people make their thing better was there was a life component and art to life was, I just knew there was more here. I didn't know what exactly, but it was a huge question mark for me. And that's why I just said, well, this is going to be called art to life because there is so much leverage <laughs> that I am just starting, I it was like wonder to me. Yeah. So this yeah. book goes a long yeah. way as to explaining it. And so maybe we can start there with, so what is going on exactly? I mean, a little bit, I know, you know, and I love how you break it up in the book, you know, the aesthetic mindset. And maybe, and maybe that's how we start there with these, these, you know, qualities of being the, you know, being playful, being curious, but maybe sort of like how, I was really curious how, how or why does this, why do we get well being from making art and being creative and neural, uh, you know, all, all, all the connections that are occurring? And what, what is that sort of, is there a way to sort of summarize it for us? Well, I think let's start by talking about the neuroesthetic mindset, because I think that's really an interesting place. You know, most of us go through our lives and we're very transactional. We're very purpose driven. We're moved from A to B. We have a lot going on. And that doesn't allow us to really let the world in around us. So, something as simple as noticing your sensory experiences, as being curious or exploring things in a playful way, or making and beholding. And, and making and beholding can be as simple as singing in the shower uh, or doodling or you know, driving in the car and singing to the radio, dancing you know, on a Friday night. This doesn't have to be high art in order to really qualify as making and beholding, right? And so just opening up yourself to this idea of an aesthetic mindset brings that level of joy and I think engagement and, and even a sense of purpose and meaning into your life. And, and that's an easy thing to do. Uh, you know, the, the way that the our brains work uh, in terms of thinking about why these sensorial experiences are so important. You know, we bring the world in through our senses. That's the only way we can, we're wired that way. That's our, our mechanisms, our machinery is to bring in through smell and taste and touch and, and, and sound. And, and so we bring the world in through these particular um, mechanisms. And those mechanisms engage um, neurons that are that we're born with we're born with a hundred billion neurons think about that that's like stars in the sky but those neurons need to be connected and it's these sensory experiences and i'll even say these salient sensory experiences that help the synapses the connections between the neurons get created those creations in turn, those connections create what we call neural pathways. And those pathways are what help us learn, grow, move, think, create all of those uh, human attributes that we know of that are sort of amplifying our potential. So when, when I talk about something like a salient memory, what or salient experience, 
Um, what that means is the things that are important to you that you remember either because they're emotionally important or because they're very practical. And each of us have our own saliency. So what might be important to me, a song from my childhood or a color or a smell that's like my, the chicken dumplings my mom made, that's going to be my salient experience. Your salient experiences are going to be different like Ivy's are. But to collectively, the, those experiences are what make us each who we are. And the arts are some of the most salient experiences that we have in our lives. Especially when you can in making a painting, um, go deep into the colors you love or the shapes you love. Those are salient experiences, right, Susan? Because you're feeding yourself more of what your brain wants. And so it's almost like going deeper into yes. that. You know, the first thing from having taken your class that I love is one of the things we talk about is no judgment. Because what, what happens is, you know, art, which is the art of creative expression, right? No matter what your medium is, is shut down often because people are told in school they're not artists or it's not reinforced. And so what's super important, and that's shut people down from doing any of the arts or being expressive. But at the end of the day, the ability to take what's inside and put it out there is huge. And then I think this concept of salient experiences, which is where these new connections are made and old ones are pruned, th thrown away, is a way to keep um, diving into what's important to you. You know, now I know why, quite frankly, and you've been to my house, I have pieces of art that I collect that it's not about what it's worth. I don't care if I ever resell it. But looking at it, and I didn't understand, now I understand why. Whenever I walk by it, there's something about it, even an abstract that relates to me, that is a part of me that I feel or I see when I look at this piece. And so I've learned through this exercise with Susan <clears throat> about salient experiences that I realize I surround myself with um, not necessarily things that I've made, but things that other people have made that speak to me in that deep way. And then every time I walk, interact with that, my brain is bringing me back and connecting me with that, which makes me stronger. So it's, it's incredible because this exercise of writing this book with Susan has taught me even about why I buy certain pieces of art. It's so interesting because as creators, as artists, uh, the, the, the way in the, almost reverse engineering of how I approach it with people is first and foremost for them to become more connected to what they love, to be yeah. involved with things that bring them joy or that meaning. And when you when you do that, it just turns out that whether it's, you know, you're going on a vacation or you're you, you're gardening or whatever the things are, or it's art making or the colors you love or the people you love or the art you choose that creates the quality of of an inspirational joyful feeling inspiration and that there is a there is a reaction a chain reaction to creativity you you almost want to make a thing mm -hmm. you know it's it's like overflow of energy and, and i love how you talk about in the book this is all energy which i i gotta mm -hmm. dive more into but it is that energy and so what you're saying ivy is so true if you if you create something that is a cl more clear communication of what you desire or what lights you up, those on the outside, and this is the, the clue to how to sell more of your art or to understand it, is they're walking around just like you were looking for things that they don't necessarily understand, but they just say yes to. Yeah, and the they're salience. What's in it for me? Mm -hmm. What? What? I don't know. I just I don't even understand this art thing, but I just want this in my bedroom, and they yes. bring it home. Yep, yep. And the clearer that communication can be, the transmission, the yes. the more likely it hits someone. So I always say, like I like humans who are fully who they are. I mean, I like art who is 100%, you know, it doesn't hold back because it goes so deep um, and so pure without altering for, you know, what they think the market wants. Or it's a pure expression of from my heart to your heart, if 
if we're in resonance, and, right? And if we're not, we're not. But that's when something grabs me is when I feel that I said, oh my, I, I have you literally used the word that, I don't know why I bought that, but it resonates with, with me deeply. Yeah. And now I know it's because it brings back one of the salient experiences I've had in my life that is so ingrained in my brain that it's like food, right? It feeds me, I guess, is the way I'd say it. Yes, absolutely. And it, and I love the idea that you will attract, therefore, mm -hmm. you put that out in the world. You might not get everyone, for sure not, but who comes? They're committed. Yeah. And they'll buy the darn thing. Yeah, the purity but, of that versus what I call Melba toast of trying to <laughs> appeal to the masses. Yes. You know, it's very different. I mean, we wrote this book to appeal for the masses because many people don't know of some of this information. But I think when you're doing an art, a piece of art, it has to you got to put that aside and it just has to be you. It's also true that the way that, I mean, what we're talking about is living an aesthetic mindset, right? We're, we're literally talking about how do you bring the world in? And if you're expressing your true nature, just the fact that you're expressing your true nature has a benefit for you individually. And I think we don't often allow for everyone's true nature to come through. What we do is we say, there's a lane. You can kind of be neutral. You can be a little sad or a little happy, but you can't be like a hundred percent yourself. And I think this is a space where the more you are yourself, the more we can have see diversity and the range of human emotion. That's so important. Like we're, we're not all one thing, right? We're not all one kind of flower. We don't see the flower in the same way. So I think the more you can open yourself up to that. Uh, the other thing I was going to say is that, you know, a lot of uh, schools are using art to help people look at art and look at things in non-judgmental ways. So uh, there's a, a woman in the book in the flourishing chapter named Meg, Meg Chisholm. She's a psychiatrist and she trains doctors to look at a piece of art and not to judge it, but just to see what's there, talk about what's there. So what do they see? What does another person see? What does another person see? And they don't judge it. They just keep listening. And the point of it is that we all see something different when we look at a painting. So even if I'm trying to express something in a painting, that may not be what someone's getting back because of their own experiences. And mm -hmm. so opening up our minds to the idea that there's a lot of ways to view something depending upon where you come from and they're all relevant and they're all valid. And so I like that too, as from a beholder's point of view is that let the beholder see what they wanna see too. I think that's a really great lesson. Yeah, and not to worry, therefore, when you're making the art, right, about what's this person going to be looking, feeling like when they see it. But, you know, one of the things, and there's a quote um, in the book from Julie Bolte-Taylor about we are, we think we are, um, we're, we're, we're feeling beings that have learned how to think, not thinking beings that feel. And I think that we all walk around thinking that we're thinking beings first, because our mind is, we're in our heads, right. right? And actually we, the universe designed us, we are actually feeling beings, because as Susan said, everything comes in through our senses and then it goes to our brain. And so if you start to think about, turn it on its head, um, ever since I heard that quote, it changed my world, because I realized we are feeling beings first and then thinking beings. And you start to walk around with this more sensorial nature, being conscious of the sensorial nature of things. And you know, 95% of what we take in goes into the unconscious and only 5% into our conscious mind. So when we are making something or expressing something and we're in that flow state and it's coming from our unconscious, that's actually coming from more data because it's 95% has gone there, then this 5% of the cognitive mind. So it's an incredible well of information. Um, and so the more I think we talk about, the more you walk around in this aesthetic mindset, taking things in, it's like having antennas and noticing everything. You know, I thought people used to walk around and think the way I do. And then you, you learn that, no, not everyone does. But like, you know, I'll walk into a space and, you know, I notice those flowers or I'll notice the detail over the door. I can't help myself. And so I realize now that's all data that's going into my brain that will come out through when I'm designing, you know, a product or critiquing something or when I'm making something. 
So I would say, and I think most artists do this, um, but it's so important. Now I understand the reasons why it's so important that we are um, attuned to that because it enriches every possibility. Another yeah. point that's worth making is, you know, I mean, makes this great point that we're feeling creatures that think, not thinking creatures that feel. And a lot of times we may not know what we feel, but we talk before we feel, right? We think before we feel. And there's a, some great work in the book that we talk about uh, this, this area of the BRCA region of the brain where sometimes there are no words. You really don't know what you think because you may have a trauma experience or, or something may just not have processed for you. And so you can create a collage. In some cases, people make masks or paintings by looking at the symbolic representation, the metaphoric story that you're telling, and it might just be abstract color, you can then understand what the feeling is and put words to the feelings. And that's more authentic than trying to think your way through to something, because really you'll just get trapped in that spiral of words and trying to logically understand something that's really a feeling. And when you figure out what that feeling is, then you have a way to solve it. Then you have a way to transform. And I think that's something that we forget too, is that processing data takes time and and it really is sort of raw data that we're processing and so if the arts can help us get that out in some form that then we can then come back and add a different kind of narrative whether that's verbal or written or any other way uh that's a gift which is why it's so beautiful in your class i remember i mean when you see people who have never painted before or because and i was one of those people you get intimidated to even put something on canvas but um there's this extraordinary material that you may not even realize was in you. And, and I love how, and I use this, well, as a troubleshooting, looking at your art or, or actually anything in your life, a really easy way in that anybody can participate in is, well, well, what does it feel like? Or mm -hmm. what do you want it to feel like? Mm -hmm. Or how do you want to actually feel? I mean, I, I love that question, mm -hmm. because then we can start, maybe we don't understand, but I can look at a, someone's work or my own, and I, I can say, oh, well, that corner, I mean, that's, I don't know, actually, what's happening there, but the feeling is right, mm -hmm. or I felt a certain way when I was making it, and I want to do more of that, yep, and yep. that's enough, just, just moving towards it, little, little steps, yeah, um, but the feel, so, so this is all energy, right? I mean, so can we, could you break that down a little bit? I mean, you know, color is, is there's light waves, there's energy. We feel a certain way, you know, I, I help a lot of people in, in their making of their art, how they feel when they're making art changes what they make. Um, but the book does a really great job of coming back to this again and again, and it's measurable, which is, it's just kind of magical to me, the whole, the whole thing. Yeah, I always say that too. It's the closest thing to magic, uh, which I love. I love, you know, it depends on the art. It depends on the sensory system and it depends on the art form, what's actually happening from a neurobiological perspective. But at a very sort of high level, you know, we bring in these um, sensorial systems and they get translated into electrical impulses or vibrations. So I'll, I'll use, I'll use smell as an example, because it's a, it's a great one, you know, everything in the universe is made up of molecules and in scent, those molecules that come into your nose and get stuck in the mucus um, are molecules of a particular type. We, I think we have over, oh gosh, it's a huge number. It's like 400 different types of scent receptors um, that we can actually um, uh, decode and over 1 trillion odors that we're able to understand. So think about that 1 trillion odors that our noses can, can understand. Mm -hmm. And, you know, once these uh, molecules are in the mucus in our nose, the neurons that are connected to the scent receptors um, have something called an axon. It's the longest part of a neuron and it actually attaches to the molecule and brings it back to the olfactory bulb, which is in, in, the, in our brains. 
I know this is, it's amazing, right? It's like, it's like we have little, all these little mechanisms. It's like great. Pop. We don't have to think about this as we're yeah. spelling it. I mean, it just happens on automatic pilot. <laughs> like this, it happens so fast. It's amazing. It's just extraordinary. But we have an area of our brain called the olfactory cortex, and it's in the temporal lobe of the brain. And that's the part of the brain that actually affects things like emotions and memory. So it makes sense. You smell something and you might remember and feel you know, something about your grandmother or, or, you know, the horse that you rode when you were 10 years old, but smells instantly and potently trigger physical and mental neurobiological responses. And it's through just that molecule that comes in through your nose. So each of our uh, different senses activate different parts of the brain. Uh, so the motor cortex is activated by movement. The occipital lobe is activated by vision. Uh, you know, touch activates the somatosensory cortex, which is in the parietal lobe. And that's, you know, we have so many sensorial um, uh, receptors. I think there's 700,000 uh, sensorial receptors in one foot. So information about the world is coming in all the time, all the time, all the time. And just to pull that back to what's salient, we couldn't possibly process all that information that's coming in. Um, and we couldn't make sense of the emotional responses that all of those sensorial experiences um, were receiving. So the other part about saliency is it edits out for us what we know is not important. So what you pay attention to is what you also think is salient. So, you know, you know that, you know how you drive home sometimes and the last mile of the road, you don't know how you got home because it's really not important to you, right? You don't have to pay attention because you've done it a million times. It turns out that that's where most car accidents happen <laughs> is that when you're not paying attention, it's that last mile, but it's your brain is basically saying, I don't need this anymore, but it's, it is so precise at what it wants to pay attention to and what is salient and what it, what is it? Well, I always say pay attention to what gets your attention because mm -hmm. that tells you something, but you know, color has um talk about energy every color you know has a different wavelength mm -hmm. and transmits a different frequency and i used to have a, a teacher in color that um in sound light and color but he would have us sta stare for an hour at he'd make a big disc of one color of orange and we would just have to meditate just stare with our eyes open at that color red and then talk about what we were feeling from the transmission and it's interesting because susan and i talked about this and that um, some of that transmission is cultural, like what what you know red might mean in an Asian country. Here it means stop. There it means money. So that definitely comes into play. But the um, energetic transmission that you get from certain colors or combination of colors and how you feel, it's all very personal. So it's not you know when someone says. Um, like we did an experiment at, at one of the first projects Susan and I did was at Milan Salone, a big design fair in Milan, Italy, and um, Google sponsored it. And we did it with, we had, it was really to prove neuroaesthetics and to prove that our body is feeling all the time. And we had three different rooms, living rooms, and each living room, we worked with our architect friend, Suchi Reddy, was um, a totally different vibration in terms of lighting color textures the art on the wall the music the scent and we did a, a people put a band on that they wore that had sensors and susan's lab and google worked to create an algorithm of taking those uh the physiology of your body and creating an algorithm as to in which room were you it was your body not your head least stressed or most um comfortable and the idea was people stayed in each room for five minutes, no talking, no um, technology, just being. It was called the space for being. Being in the room, sensing the color palette, the textures, the um, scent, the music. And then at the end, we took the band off, downloaded the data, and of course deleted it because it's Google. And we, <laughs> we, we, we get, we gave the participant back that data and showed them in which room by this beautiful kind of wow. ink blot test their body felt the most comfortable and we thought and then we get and then we gave them a list of what elements were in that room where their body was the most comfortable and we thought this is going to be a disaster if the room people liked 
or thought they liked, uh, their body liked as well, because the point was to prove that our body's feeling all the time and it might be different than your mind. So sure enough, I think it was 56%, it was over half the people had a different reaction. You know, they walked into a room and maybe the living room and they, they liked it because cognitively, because um, it reminded them of a living room they saw in a magazine or their friend's house, but their body was feeling and it wasn't feeling comfortable in that room. And so we were able to show the difference. So the idea was to basically let people know we are embodied beings, remember, because I think we forget, and that we're feeling all the time and we have agency over um, our environments. Yeah. It's like, like, and there are some things that don't cost a lot of money, you know, to have certain color flowers in front of us in our environment. We may think that's a small thing, but our sensory system, our body is loving it and wants it. It's like the operator operating manual for being an artist, being a creative, well, thriving human being, which absolutely is, is not an artist or non-artist. It's just this is this is what we need. We yeah. need more all the time. We're soaking soaking it all up. And more of what makes us more. It's very the interesting thing was at the end people said, well, what was the right answer? Which is the room I'm supposed to like? And we were horrified because it's like Oh my God, no, this is about you. Right. <laughs> there is no right answer. And it's the same thing with a, a, a painting, I feel. And it's not, there isn't a right or a wrong. It is what works for you. Like Susan said, what I may find beautiful or salient, you don't. And I learned from Susan, which I hadn't realized. I mean, it's like a duh, but yeah, that our brains are as unique as our thumbprint. You know, we kind of think, well, if we went to the same school and had the same experience or shared the same boyfriend, we're probably the same. <laughs> and um, it's not the case. We are each our own. Our brains are 100% unique, like our thumbprint. So this idea that we have to constantly inhale more of ourselves, I love that because it gives us permission to mm -hmm. say, um, get to that place of figure out what makes you more you um, and, and that's a question that what i love about that inquiry is that nothing can stop us it's not in an encyclopedia somewhere you already have this information it's just paying attention more paying it's attention an internal inquiry mm -hmm. and, and the, the question of which room do i prefer is a little like i just and this is a question that i get all the time I don't know my style. I got to figure it out. I mean, Diebenkorn had a style and I don't know my style. And they're looking around for something that's yeah. going to hold, but it's like, it, you it's, already got it. It's inside. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You already got it. Yeah. Good news, bad news. You have to unfold it, which is different than not have it at all. Right. Mm. I think that's the interesting. Well, you were talking about flourishing earlier. And I think one of the things that's worth saying about flourishing is that it's really a muscle that you get stronger when you use it. So that's really important. And there's attributes of flourishing that help you do that. So you were touching on awe. Awe is certainly an attribute of flourishing, but so is wonder and curiosity and enriched environments. We think creativity, rituals, novelty, and surprise. And I think you use all those things when you're creating art, right? Yeah. And when I, cause I've worked with Nick and when he says he, those exact words, you know, where's the surprise? Like where's the, even within the painting sometimes, he uh, pushes you to um, look at the painting from that perspective so that the painting is flourishing, I just realized. <laughs> and, yes, and this is what's so amazing. It's, the painting is just the artifact of, of this flourishing way of being. Yes. I mean, great art comes from flourishing. It's a byproduct. And we always, you know, I'm trying to help people make amazing art. And we can get overly focused on the end result and how do you do the thing and we need to learn these colors and everything, but it's reverse engineering it a little yeah, bit. Or, we need to learn to flourish and then what comes out is going to be very personal, authentic, yeah. and potent. Or great art can come from despair, right? Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think it's I think it's um it's like learning how to uh, tap into what's inside that wants to be expressed. And you know, this through the adventure of this book, I mean it it's so clear that for health we must express what's inside. I mean, I think we get in part ill sometimes when and we've been taught not to express ourselves, you know, yeah. from when we're little, like hold back, yeah. hold back. Um, because when we don't, what, we have micro traumas all day, you know, there's big traumas and then there's micro traumas. And 
we just keep, we hold them in, we hold them in, we hold them in, and then they explode. Um, one day we have a, in the book, there's an example of a woman from art to ashes. It was training frontline firemen coming out of fires, immediately giving them a paintbrush and having them paint to get out how they were feeling instead of taking, you know, they had a trauma because they couldn't save someone they left burning behind. And then they would take that trauma home with them to their family and act out on it. Um, but when they were given the paintbrush or the to start making something to express themselves immediately, that got out on the canvas. And then this 25 year old fireman we interviewed went home and he was fine. And now he's training other fire uh, houses how to make, how to paint, how to art, you know. And again, it doesn't have to be good. It's the fact that he was putting how he was feeling down on canvas that released that. I never, yeah. I never understood until reading this book or thought of it this way that in the book, you guys speak about how, you know, there's feelings and emotions, which is really interesting. I never thought about the difference and I, I want to touch on that yeah. for sure. But also that it's not that, I mean, we have all these great emotions and hard ones and difficult ones, and it's not wrong. You're never getting rid of that. The problem is they get stuck yes. and that there needs to be movement of emotional movement, which completely makes me the painting is such a great metaphor or art making because it's actually moving through the thing yeah and and um emotion is energy in motion i think it was in q that said that there's a poet that opens up the flourishing yeah. chapter and he and and it just is actually john boyer said that also it's kind of a known fact for some people that and i love that if you think of it that way that emotion is energy in motion and we are we are wired to keep that dynamic the energy going through our body and when it gets stuck we get stagnant and that's how we can get sick and you know partly right yeah no it's really true it, you know it shows up in a lot of different ways in a lot of different art forms um the, the first responders are so interesting because some of them painted um like aaron who's in the book mm -hmm. others doodle Others do metal work. Others, um, you know, find that um, welding is really important. Others weave. So they all find their own medium also. And I think that's that's really interesting. We also found that Ivy was talking about like releasing things. Uh, there's a researcher at, in University of Texas, Austin named James Pennebaker who studies expressive writing. And what he finds is that people that write down a secret into their journal on a piece of paper, they may rip it up, throw it away, burn it, but the act of getting that secret out of their brains lightens their cognitive load and allows them to have capacity for other things. I would think the same is true with painting. If you're getting an, an emotion out onto a canvas, you're lightening your cognitive load so that you have capacity. And we, you know, we only have so much cognitive load. I always say to Ivy, I can't talk after six o'clock at night because I have no cognitive load. And every time I do, I always regret it. And I always come back the next day and say, afterthought, afterthought, because I can't think anymore. Well, that's true for everybody. And, and to be able to lighten your cognitive load through expressing yourself is, is just makes so much sense. You know, Nick brought up, do explain, because I, I remember it was yeah. fascinating, the difference between um, emotion and feeling or something. What yeah. happens first, right? Yeah, how we get it's emotions like, come first, and then we have feelings about the perception. Of the, I mean, that just amazed me. Actually, this morning, I was working in my sketchbook, and I was, I was thinking about the color choices, and, and I wanted to bring in an emotion. I just started, I really got clear about it. I want to and contribute to this thing that was kind of drab an intensity a more fiery emotion and I used a lighter very vibrant yellow in a dark area that was dull and it was just such an interesting way to think about mm. art making and color yeah. choices and the, the feeling of it you know or the, the then that creates an emotion for me yeah that then kind of keeps me going and gets me excited and well, I love what you do, the practice, because I remember even at the house at Sea Ranch, 
is when you started this idea of in your book, right? Every morning. It's the 20 minute. 20 art, minute. Daily yeah, art you, you were that's what I'm saying. You are a poster <laughs> child because I wake up and grab my coffee, and Nick was already there with his pastels <laughs> and his crayons. And every day he would start the day by doing this page in, in the diary. So it's a beautiful practice. It's And I really think of this one thing that I'm doing now is. If I'm getting up and I'm a rush and I've got this interview and I, I all the things, I'll just paint the page a color, which takes two seconds because I know the value. It's literally 30 seconds. Choosing a color, adjusting the color, and putting it on brings me into such a it is such a rich experience, as well as studying the notes and making sure that the you know plants are watered and then I lock the door it really, it changes my whole, it does have a profound effect on, on how I go out into the world. Yep. It's, it's kind of amazing. And, did, is, and didn't Sharon Salzberg t tell us that, me, I mean, making art is the same thing as meditation. I mean, in terms of the presence, when you make a piece of art, you are, you have to be present. And so that does a lot of the similar things for your brain that meditation does, right, Susan? Yeah, which, what Sharon talked about was she felt that the arts were one of the highest forms of meditation, that, you know, there, I guess, there are many ways to meditate, but that creating art was one of the highest forms because it required you to really be so um, embodied and so so present in, in what you were doing. Yeah, the great um, thing about this book is we interviewed, just so you know, like, uh, we keep mentioning these people's names, like 100 different people. Yeah. I mean, we did it during covid and because I was, I didn't have to commute down to Google, which is, you know, it was three hours of my day. So from 6 a.m. to 9 a.m., we would interview um, people either in the arts, yourself included, or um, scientists, um, just a real range. And then we spent the next year, it was like weaving a tapestry together of all of these interviews um, to be informational about the science, but do it through storytelling and people. Yeah. So when we throw out people's names, whether they're scientists or um, artists or like the woman doing art to ashes, that's where it's coming from is the book is delivering the information, but through story and through information. As, as well as all the, these studies and the work, you mentioned a, a woman, in, I believe it's in England, who studied thousands of creatives or and had, you know, actually tracking well-being connected to art making and so yeah that's daisy fancourt yes, and yes. She, and what's interesting about daisy's work um what she did was um uh epidemiological studies so she was looking at large data sets of generalized populations and she what she was able to do was when she um analyze the data around the arts. She took out things like age, race, gender, income. So she really tried to take out all the variables that would impact um, sort of the results of her study. And what she found was that uh, people that do one art activity a month on general live 10 years longer. So life expectancy grows. Um, she found that kids that that make art, make better decisions. They stay in school longer, they go to school more often, and they have uh, greater life uh, choices as they as they move forward, which, which makes sense. She also found that um, uh, when, when uh, young moms are using art with their babies for things like postpartum depression, um, they do better than um, moms who aren't singing with their babies. And so Daisy's done a number of studies. She's now doing it in the United States with a similar um, kind of data set to look at things around uh, uh, youth mental health or neurodegeneration and the role of the arts and aesthetic experiences in how, um, and the data is there, right? So it's not, this is not saying we think this is going to happen. What she's doing is mining the data and saying, this is what happened. This is the behavior that happened. And these are the results of those behaviors. So epidemiological research is one kind of knowledge, like neuroscience is one kind of knowledge, like public health data is another kind of knowledge or anthropological data. So it gives us another way to come at um, how the arts transform us. We think that there are as many as 34,000 distinct emotions, and those emotions are what we feel first, and then that turns into what we're calling feelings. And so, um, and emotions can range from things like um, 
joy, sadness, acceptance, disgust, fear, anger, you know, there's a huge range of those emotions, but that's what gets translated into feelings. And then 34, what gets translated. 34,000, Susan? I don't know. 34,000 distinct emotions. Can you imagine trying to write that down one day? That would be an art piece in itself, writing down what those 34,000 emotions are. And, and Get going. And, and a life goal to just experience all of them, like one a day, and yeah. you could maybe fit it in in a 50 year of yeah. life. Yeah, you're going to live till 180. Yes. Based on Susan's statistic, you probably could do that, uh, figure out the 34,000 one a day for us. Well, and one of the experts or someone you mentioned in the book around this, that he was, he organized them. So there's eight general buckets. And I wanted to ask you, because it was like you said, um, you know, acceptance and joy was one, and there's eight of them there. But I was curious because love wasn't listed, and I wondered about that. That is that is that joy? I mean, is that an emotion? Is that a feeling? And I just yeah, that's a really good question. Um, I don't know. You know, you think I know a lot of people talk about love as not being uh, an emotion, um, like happiness. That it, 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 yeah. It, it's, it's a combination of emotions. So, it, you know, when he, when he speaks um, to this idea of emotion, uh, there's so many kind of combination, combinations and, and variations. Um, but that, I don't know, that's a really good question. We should ask. Maybe love, yeah. love is a, a complex combination of things, because if it was one thing, it may be easier to find, but when it's a complex uh, system, uh, well, uh, actually, yeah, happiness is not there, which I think is super interesting too, right? Like, what is happiness? Well, joy maybe is the catch-all mm -hmm. for love and and all the yeah, rest. Happiness, I can see, is a combination of a number of things that has to be mm -hmm. in place for you to be happy. But Susan has a great love story about um, which which relates to neuroplasticity with Rick and the kiss. <laughs> Are you going to share that? Oops. I will. I will. I'm, I'm still fixated on is love an emotion. Um, and I'm just going to read this really quickly. Love is a secondary emotion. Love is an emotion that combines often two of the primary emotions. Oh. So love is an emotion, but you often have to figure that it's a manifestation of something and that love, um, let's see, love might make you feel trust and trust is an emotion. So that's interesting. Hmm. A combination. Yeah, that I think that makes sense. This is the sequel to the book. Of <laughs> Just saying. And there's a lot of different kinds of love. There's romantic love, mm -hmm. which is interesting. There's um, uh, just a huge range of what we think of as love. It's a complex mental function. So that's interesting. And even includes memory. Mm. Yeah, I think, yeah, I think that's, a, I think that's a sequel. I love, I okay. love one thing that you that I remember that hit me was that we will remember and it relates to art making that's why it hit me that the if you can connect or the, the emotional potency of the thing you make if someone experiences emotions they will remember it right like we remember songs and and I've thought about times where I've made art and I was nervous about it, but I mean, whatever the emotion was, it it often was a piece that people would buy or relate to more, or, you know, that just that we are hardwired to connect to emotions. Um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if there was more emotion in it, yeah. whether it was torment or, yeah. <laughs> you know, or despair even, I mean, that's why there's some pieces of art that you could just feel mm -hmm. what's being transmitted it doesn't matter whether you know it could be joy it could be happiness it could be despair but it's yes. it's that transmission that comes from the creator having been pure like we said in the beginning about it that you feel yes makes me think of uh we have a, a section in the book uh talking about trauma uh and and uh we have an artist um who painted uh Gosh, Ivy, how many how many images said Judy? Oh, oh. It was like the Judy. Do you yes, know? It was like Judy, 36 yes. images that she just, it was a great exercise because she had met um, her husband who was a Hopi Indian. And he and the irony is he wanted to learn how to paint. And she said, do what your ancestor did with the cave paintings. No judgment, just start to tell a story 
and then paint over it, whitewash it, just like in the caves or something, and don't worry about it. And she hung up the phone as she told us, and she, and she said, and I thought, wait a minute, that's a great idea. And she got out of the canvas, and she, she had a lot of um, childhood trauma, and she yeah. couldn't, and she was not a painter. I mean, she had never painted before. She was an English major, but she started, she started to put, just started with a brush and cans of paint, and then she would, luckily she documented, she'd take a picture of it, and then she put white paint over it, and did another, and, and the progression of when you look at the images, and we have a, a section in the book where we show her images, like over the, you know, 100 days or whatever, you could, the storytelling that was there of her emotions, and she relived the emotions as she was doing these paintings, but then she, because she whitewashed <clears throat> after each painting, I, I saw the, it was beautiful. She called it, the white painting was, you walk up to it. I'll talk about energy. All it was, was a white texture because it had, but it was, there was lumps and bumps because it had all the stacking of paintings underneath it. And you could feel the transmission of that energy. I mean, you know, it's funny because sometimes you go to museums and in the 50s or 60s, you know, there was an artist that would do just a white canvas with one gray line, but it was pristine, flat white, and it was true minimal art, and I wouldn't get anything out of it. Her, it was white, but you could feel all the energy and emotion yeah. stacked and layered under that white canvas. Yeah, yeah, it's like Joan Mitchell's work. You know, you just walk in a room and you're like surrounded by feelings of gardens and space and storms and you just feel it and Judy's work is just extraordinary in that way she wrote I I dove deep into her well you told me about her a long time yeah, ago so yeah. I, I know of her but she's she wrote uh artists taught me that an image can be a transformate transformative gift of healing art has taught me that what we see is only a fraction of what is there art has taught me that the longer I make art the greater the mystery and art has taught me that walls and doorways are the same thing. Mm. You know, it's it's just just blows open the uh, the, the the window. You know, the, mm -hmm. the exposure to art. It's not a thing. It's your life, and and people can feel it. It's mm -hmm. really something. Mm -hmm. um, yep. So the the healing aspect of it. Uh, I love that quote. Uh, if art doesn't make us better, then what on earth is it for by Alice Walker that you have in the book? Yeah. I've never heard that, but <laughs> yeah, it really yeah. is. It's something we do first for ourselves and, and then and then for the rest for the rest of the world. And there's a challenge that artists have, I think, that, to give this to ourselves, you know. Yeah, right? the gift of yeah. Of first doing it for us, right? And then seeing how the world reacts. Yeah. I mean, but I think that's the only way to be. That's why I love art exhibitions because someone's put it out there and then it's really for someone to come by and resonate with it. And you can't get upset. You know, there may be, like you said, one out of every 40 people or every 10,000 that, but if they deeply connect with it, um, I remember the first piece of art I ever bought. I was in a gallery, I was in my 20s, and I literally stood in front of it and I wept. And I was in my 20s, I was a student, and the gallery owner came over and said, are you okay? And I said, this language, I don't know what it is, but it's it's speaking to me in something I've, I, I've been there, I don't know what it is. And it was like, it was $500, which at that point was a lot of money to me in my 20s, like I was a student. and. She, um, cause she said, you know, do you, I said, no, I can't buy it. And I left. And then like a week later, I'd come by to visit it. And it was this deep, deep ancient connection oh. to whatever that thing was telling me. And she ultimately, the next time I came back, she said, you know, I spoke to the artist and if you want to pay $50 a month, you know, we'll do that or $25 a month. And fast forward, this artist, it turned out to be now this like Dominic Damar. It was, it was, um, it was a piece of sculpture that used twisted paper and uh, it was a three-dimensional piece but he's very famous now and I um that was that was such I guess I'm grateful that that's the first my first encounter with it maybe that's why I'm so passionate about this area because what she did for me like she acknowledged what she was seeing in me and she made it possible for me to live with that piece and you know, I'll never sell it. I don't. I don't care that he's famous. What I cared is that um, 
it spoke to me and it reflected back to me a piece of me that I didn't even know existed. And I became curious to understand uh, why. And over the years, I have understood what that hand-dyed, twisted papers really meant. So it was a beautiful discovery. I think that's what great art does, right? It's, it, it's a two-way thing because not only does the artist get to express himself, but then the viewer or the owner finds a piece of themselves that they hadn't found before. That's so beautiful. And it's really the invitation of the book. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, Meow Wolf, do you, you know, the work of Meow Wolf. Yes. Yes. I think that's another great example where you don't also have to wait to get invited into a gallery or you can actually start your own thing and share your own work. And, you know, Meow Wolf, I think, exemplifies that artists who have something to say that came together and are doing extraordinary work, surprise, novelty, exploration, taking us other places, helping us sort of see what's possible. And that started out of really nothing, right? And now it's grown dramatically. Yeah, for those of you that don't know, it was a group of street artists in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and they ended up buying a bowling alley and and taking it over and creating these experiences. It's, it's more experiential art where you walk through, it's digital and analog, but what it does is it, it gets you out of your cognitive mind. And, you know, Susan and I talk about a lot of the art of the future is not only just paintings or flat, it's where you're gonna be walking into these spaces. And again, with the mission, I think, of getting you out of your cognitive mind and into your senses. So it's really about what alivens your senses. And I think there'll be, many art forms um and again like we said it's personalized medicine right it's what what do you need and 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 how how to see things in new and different ways absolutely going through that meow wolf suddenly the refrigerator that we're all just <laughs> we just think of it as a place you open it to get your hard-boiled egg becomes a doorway into another room a chamber you cannot help leaving that experience uh seeing more possibilities. Absolutely, it's the word right. possibilities, because yeah. it's like it's all in service of possibilities. And I think where we are as a society, we need to amp up our imaginations yes. to solve the world's problems. So yeah. I think it's actually a very creative time. I think we're going to be really moving into as a society a much more creative time because we are going to collectively need to exercise our imaginations. And so I think art will play a bigger role. And we're, you know, we're thrilled. Originally, we, 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 we thought this book would be out a few years ago. And it's like, no, no, it's not good enough. And we kept at it, and we kept at it. And you realize that um, everything is just perfect. The timing is perfect because I think that the world needs the book now more than it would have three years ago. Yes. Yeah. And there's so many other worlds. That's the other thing is that going through the refrigerator door, virtual reality is, is another world. You know, fiction is another world. And I think creating these new worlds is what I, I was talking about too. And, and the capacity to be agile and to be innovative and creative happens our whole life. It starts when we're very little. And I think the more we bring this work to children and we get kids starting to have permission to create past third grade. That's also really important. And as we're aging, I was at a retirement community recently and they have a fantastic studio. And I said, well, how many people use the studio? The work is beautiful. And they said about 5% of the population in this facility uses the art studio. And I said, why, why is that? And they said, because they've never made art before and they don't think that they are gonna be able to be good at it. So giving people permission at any age to make and to create, I mean, they have thousands of dollars of kilns and art and materials, and it's for 5% of the population who are exquisite artists, but that's not what art is at its truest sort of democratizing sense. I love in the book, you talk about uh, that it's, it's the artists that create the culture and it's not, it's not, those experts it's it's us individually mm -hmm. expressing who we are mm -hmm. that's the culture and then the culture creates the community absolutely and the community creates a humanity it is it is so impress so important and pressing for us to step into creativity in 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 the for the future for the future of the planet yeah i just got the chills when you said that because that is the lineage that is what has to happen and that is within our control. Yeah. So keep on making art. 
<laughs> you guys, this has been so inspiring. We went way over, but that's fine because <laughs> this is such an important. Uh, well, I know you two have to, to run, but yeah. I, I really appreciate you. Well, both. thank you. And your book is thank you. Amazing. Again, it's your, your, brain, your brain on, on our art. Uh, it's out today, I think. Um, and uh, for those of, so for those of you guys listening, head on uh, over to uh, arttolife.com. Click on podcasts. You can see link to some of these artists that uh, we spoke about. Uh, there's a link to get the book. Um, we also have a new feature. There's a little yellow tab. If you want to ask a question, you can record an audio in, on the website. And if you have some questions here, um, I have so many questions that we still didn't get to but um yeah. and actually we'll give you to post our link to our website which has a place where we want to collect stories a place to collect stories about how art changed your life because i think um yeah we want to gather those stories yeah and th i have to say thank you seriously yes. for i mean my god art to life right and life is art and yeah. i mean you have you have taught people that and showed people that and thank you you've yeah. done a great service well humanity. thank you now I, I think you got it right it's your art on your brain right i think that's <laughs> what the book should be called. <laughs> your art on brain your brain and art your brain on art how the arts transform us oh, all okay. right thank you so much <laughs> you're and, welcome and we'll see all you listener folks um we'll see you next week and really thanks so much for being here and again thank you guys you're welcome all right bye thank bye. you bye